Genesis chapter 2 down to verse 15. We've been, we've been working through, um, we've been working through seeing the right view of God and having the right view of God as a, as a body of believers and understanding that if we do not have the right view of God, if we do not understand God correctly in his character, then we don't understand the gospel correctly. If we don't understand the character and the nature of God, how he deals with sinners, how he hates sin, how he's righteous and good and kind and just, then we don't understand the gospel. And so we've, we've spent the last six months working through God's character. Um, so we're, we've been spending six months working through God's character, having and trying to see a, a right view of, of God. And now we're kind of transitioning into having a right view of man. Having a right view of man. And as we do that, we have to understand that, that the root of all the world's disbelief, or the, rather the root of all the world's sin, is unbelief. We don't believe God really hates sin, or we, we don't believe God is really that holy, or we don't believe God is really that just. And so we, we sin. So we must have a right belief of God and a right belief of who we are. We are made with purpose. We are made with direction that God has given us. And I want us to see this morning that God has given us a tremendous weight. A tremendous weight. I tell you what, hold your finger back in Genesis 2. Let's actually go back to Genesis 1 for a moment. Because I do want us to see something there as well. Before we even really get into Genesis 2. This is what Genesis 1, verse 26 says. So this is the culmination of all creation. God is, is, has, has crafted by the power of His own voice the universe itself and every single corner thereof. And now He gets to man and making man. It says in verse 26, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth God created man in his own image in the image of God he created him male and female he created them Verse 28, God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth and every tree which has fruit yielding seed. It shall be food for you. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the sky and to everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made and behold, it was very good. And there was morning and there was, or there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Let's pray. Lord, I ask that you would please, please give guidance now. We need your word. God, we need your truths to bear weight on our lives <clears throat> and to bear weight and responsibility on our lives that, that we are not our own, but that we are yours, that you are our creator and we are the creation, that you are the master and ruler over every single thing and we are merely your humble servants. Lord, we are very much tempted to have a high view of ourselves. God, crush that, please. Please crush that this morning in us. And it is not some in this room. It is all of us in this room. We want to be the masters of our world. We want to rebel against you because we want to be God. Our flesh cries for that. But Lord, please crush that. And if we are in Christ, please sanctify and clean us more and more day by day in Christ. Lord, if we are not in Christ, 
If there are those in here that do not know you, and there are certainly some, Lord, please help them see the great, the great sin that we have in our lives apart from Christ, that it will drag us down into an eternity of separation from you. Hell itself. Lord, I ask that you would please show us these realities. Preach your character this morning, God, and who we are because of who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. So, we live in a world where culture says that we are to be made much of. That we are, again, the masters of our universes. In fact, if you think about all the things that we teach our children growing up often, it's, it's kind of gearing them up to be independent, right? To be the masters of their own homes. And if we're not very careful, we kind of tend to push them into saying, okay, well now you get to figure this stuff out. That you get to decide which way you go. So think about as kids get older, oftentimes, and this is not necessarily wicked, but, but if we're not careful, these things can turn into an idolatry of sorts, right? That we say, okay, well what would you like for supper? Or what would you like to do with, what would you like to wear today? And, and, and some of those things are practical things. But as they get older, sometimes kids, especially... Um, in high school, in those areas, we're like, okay, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? What would you like to do? And so we're kind of gearing them a little bit, if we're not careful, and shaping them to think about, okay, what, what do I want? You know, my parents have asked me that. The guidance counselors asked me that. My grandparents certainly have asked me that. What do I want? What do I desire from my life? And the culture takes that to the extreme, right? We might use those things as prodding things to, to try to help our children understand that one day they'll be on their own. We're going to give them the boot out the door. Hey, go, you know, be, be, a, be an adult, live your life, fulfill what God has called you to do. But the culture takes that and says, listen, you are God. There's no one else. You are God, so you are the master. You are the ruler. Be whatever you want to be. And so what does your heart desire? What do you want? And our culture is a culture that preaches this often. That puts man on the pedestal. That suggests that really we might have we might have issues in our lives, but we're we're not necessarily wicked men, right? Because we're good. Now, now I know a lot of people, even in our culture, in our Bible Belt culture, they would say with their lips that they believe that men are inherently wicked, but they believe in the way they walk their lives that we're really not that bad. That, that men aren't really that bad. Sin's not really that big a deal because we can overcome these things. And we often live our lives this way. We make decisions and we consult no one. We think about what we would like most, what suits us best. <clears throat> but the reality is that we have a master and that we have a ruler, a sovereign king. We spent the last several weeks looking at the sovereignty of God. And we think about the sovereignty of God in a few different ways. One way in which we think about it is that God rules over every second of every day, right? So if I get in a car wreck, it's the sovereignty of God that is over that event. It's not something else outside of God's sovereign hand. And so we can definitely look at God's sovereignty in that way, a practical everyday sovereignty that touches every area of our lives. But in another way, God's sovereignty preaches that God is sovereign, that he is ruler over all things and not just in a distant way but he actually has authority over every land over every shadow underneath every rock god has authority and from the very beginning it was so you don't have the authority yourself i don't we are made by god listen to what we said in verse 26 then god said let us make man in our image according to our likeness now, if you're paying attention, you saw a few pronouns being used that would imply not just one, but more than one, right? So let us make man in our image and according to our likeness, which I believe preaches the, the triune nature of God. Right? If you actually go back to the first few verses of Genesis 1, it preaches that the Spirit of God, distinct, was hovering over the waters in a very tangible way. So you have the Trinity presented and shown even in Genesis 1. That's not really the focus of what we're at today, but we do understand that God in his triune nature is the one who has decided to make us. 
So God made us. Now we're made in God's image. And so there is a, 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 a uniqueness to that. That we're not like the animals around us, right? Now our culture doesn't understand that quite as much. And so we worship animals sometimes if we're not very careful. We have animals that may be in our families and we think, you know, if this animal passes away, then we're going to treat this like a human being. But really we're distinct, vastly so. Our value is vastly different than that of animals. But what we must understand more than anything is that we are creatures created by God. And that implies by the very nature of a potter over the clay, by, a very, by the very nature of a creator over his creation, that we are bound to our creator. That we don't have a choice. He is our master. He is our ruler. And because God doesn't have an area that is not under his domain, there is no, there, nowhere that we can go that you and I can lead to to escape his authority. We have it over us all the time. And you may think, well, there are millions, billions of people who are not living like they are under the authority of God. Absolutely. Right? So they will be under the justice and are under the, what, we said, what we see in Scripture. They are under the wrath of God even as we speak. But we are all under the authority of God. He made us. So that implies a few things. It implies that, again, he is our master, he is our ruler, and our decisions must be from him. It implies that God is God and that we are not, that he is everything to us. Every one of us are expected to live according to God's standards. And this is the passage I wanted to look at in Genesis chapter 2. So turn over there with me. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. So again, God has created man in, our, in his image. And he gave them, or he gave man, a structure and an order. And this is what he says in Genesis 2, verse 15. It says, Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely. But from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it, you will surely die. So one of the implications that we see from Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 is that if we have a, a ruling authority over us, that if you have God ruling over you, then you, by implication, are required to obey this God. He's not a ruler. He is your ruler. He is my ruler. We are required to obey God. And so we, we must understand the great weight and responsibility and great obligation that rests over us to obey God. God created us. He gave us life and he is giving us life. Every single day, God is keeping you alive. I think we mentioned this a few weeks ago about the sovereignty of God over every single thing that we're doing. If God has you alive right now, or if you are alive right now, it's because God wants you to be and is actively holding you alive, holding you up. I think we kind of view, I mentioned this a few weeks ago, we, we don't say it, but we live like God is that deistic God, that he has simply just put the world in order, and he has kind of just turned it and, and went, and then he kind of steps back. And so when you go to sleep at night, most nights you expect to wake up in the morning, Right? You don't really think too much about it. Maybe God won't let me wake up in the morning. We don't really think too much about it, but God is actively sustaining us every moment of every day. And so therefore, we have an obligation to obey this God. We do not have the right to rebel. We don't have the right to go our own way. We don't have the right to choose our own path. The psalmist says that, we, that he is our shepherd and we are, he is our God and we are his sheep, that we are the sheep of his pasture, what scripture says. It has that, that illustration a lot, that analogy a lot for Christians, that, that we are the sheep of his pasture. He is God and, and we are absolutely not God. Now the issue with this, of course, is not just that we are obligated to obey, but that God actually expects us to obey. Now listen to this. God expects our obedience. 
when he put Adam and Eve in the garden, he told them, do not touch this thing. Do you think God did that thinking, you know what? It's really not that big a deal if they do. Well, no. He has this expectation. He gave us the parameters. He gave us the structure. He gave us the order. Now, you know as well as I do what Ephesians 1 says about God saving sinners. That before the foundation of the world, God chose to save sinners, right? So we know that even in Genesis 2, God knows these two fools will inevitably go after the fruit. But do you think God's like, well, that's okay. I have a plan B. Well, no. He has an expectation. He gave them those parameters. He gave them the structure. And they are responsible to obey. God's mandate for us expects obedience. Go back to chapter 1 in Genesis. So God said again in verse 26 that he made man in his own image. And he said in, in the second part of chapter 26, he says, Let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God told them, he said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the, every living thing that moves on the earth. Y'all know what this is called, this section right here? It's called the creation mandate. That we are mandated by God to do these things. So Adam and Eve had a responsibility. And I think that actual that responsibility, it does not, it does not become shattered or broken when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, did it? They were still called to leave the garden. God actually tells them again later, be fruitful, multiply, subdue the earth. Noah gets off the ark. Everybody's dead, right? Except for he and his family. What does he tell them to do? Go, be fruitful, multiply, go to the world, subdue it, right? And we're called and we have that expectation to obey that creation mandate, these rules from the very beginning. But God doesn't just give us rules. And again, these are the parameters and this is the order that he gives them in. Think about what he says, what God says about man in verse 27. It says that God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So God gives a structure and an order right down to the, to the most unique things about us. The things that, that separate us. Um, as far as being in, in, in roles of men and women. By our, by our very design, he has created us uniquely in that way. And it says that God actually blessed them in that way. So think about that. That's the order that God has given. That's the structure and the framework that God has given. And we must, if we're trying to understand and have a right view of ourselves. Okay, so we've worked for six months over having a right view of God. Well, if, if we have a right view of God, then we have to understand, again, a clear, right picture of ourselves. That this is the order that God has given. This is the structure and the framework that God has given. And he expects us to obey. To obey. Now remember, this is not just a mandate. This is not just a desire from the Lord in Genesis 1 and 2, right before Adam and Eve sinned. The Lord doesn't throw his hands up after Genesis 3 and go, you know what, I, I failed. I guess they'll just do whatever they want. Does the desire of the Lord for us to obey, does the command of the Lord for us to obey, does it carry forth? Absolutely. This is what Paul says in Romans chapter 1. You can turn with me if you would like. Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Paul says about the world and the sons of the world. He says in verse 18 this. He says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them. So the very beginning when God made them man in his image he gave man an innate understanding that God is God that there is a God and that he is the God and that there is a responsibility to obey this God 
and to yield to this God. Verse 20, for since the creation of the world, Adam and Eve time, even before, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor God or honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. God has this innate understanding within the heart of men that they know that he exists and that he is master and ruler over the world. So God has this expectation for us to obey. And he desires our obedience. He, he wants our obedience. It's not like God is a judge, like an earthly judge. And he says, well, you know, it's not really my rules that you have to follow. It's the, it's the law of the land. And my job as an earthly judge is to just uphold those laws. I don't love the laws. I'm just bound to them. That's it. God's not like that. God, God desires obedience. The laws flow from his very nature. So think about what Samuel said to Saul in 1 Samuel 15. If you remember this passage, it's a passage when Saul kind of messes up. Saul, of course, is impatient. He's, he's not waiting on Samuel to show up and bless the battle. So he goes ahead and battles, and then they, they're given victory. And then they sacrifice. He's, he's waiting to, for Samuel to, to, to you know, sacrifice the animals because he's a priest and prophet in this way. But then Saul disobeys. He disobeys God. And what Samuel says is so important. Saul says basically kind of, I think Saul says what most people say nowadays. Hey, listen, I just did so to honor the Lord. I know I disobeyed, but I did it. Whatever I do, I'm doing it for the Lord. So therefore it's justified. But Saul said, or Samuel said, that's not how it works. Listen to what he says in verse 22 of 1 Samuel 15. He says, has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. So God desires our obedience. We might feel like, well, it's okay. I can go sin all I want, and then I can sacrifice for it. And I can do something. I can kind of make up for it. And that's what a lot of world religions teach. We make errors. We mess up. We even sin, maybe. That's what world religions teach, even, even some... Um, under the banner of what they say is Christian Christianity, Catholics, for instance, or Mormons or something like that, will say, hey, listen, we mess up. It's okay. You just got to kind of balance that out by some of your actions. You can do it. We can't. That's the issue. We can't make up for it. But we can't be guilty of falling in the same trap as Saul. That no matter how we feel about it, God hates disobedience. He hates disobedience. He demands and requires disobedience. See, obedience is not optional. He does not say, hey, it's okay for you to think about obedience. You must obey. And God deserves to have our obedience. We read out of first or Romans chapter 1 that, that God is the one that they gave up to go after the lusts of the world. This God, he, he deserves our obedience. He is most worthy because of who He is and because of what He's done. And, and again, we see this not just in Romans 1, but throughout the New Testament, that there is this expectation that we obey God. Now the issue is not that we just obey God. Brothers, sisters, the issue is that God expects and demands something that you can't give. Which is not just obedience, but perfect obedience. We have to understand that. You hear that? God demands perfect obedience. Now most of you hopefully are rightfully, rightfully thinking, but I, I can't give perfect obedience. But that doesn't mean that the call from God is not still there. We still are required perfect obedience. Obedience. 
This is Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28. God is expressing these curses that will come upon the people of Israel if they do not observe his commands. And listen to what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 15. It says, but it, but it shall come about if you, Israelites, do not obey the Lord your God. Okay, that's general. But then what does he say? To observe to do all his commandments and his statutes with which I charge you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. The Lord does not say, it's okay if you just get part of them right. It's okay if you try really hard. No, we are required to keep the whole law. Think about what Paul says in Galatians chapter 3. So this is Galatians chapter 3. Paul is tying these things back together. The gospel back from the old covenant. In Galatians chapter 3, Paul says this. For as many... This is verse 10 of Galatians 3. For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. In other words, if we're under the works of the law, we're under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. We're called to live out in perfect obedience the law that God has given and if, we've, if, if we believe what Scripture says about God's justice, about God's holiness, about God's righteousness, then we understand that God has every right to demand perfection from you, doesn't He? He has every right. At the moment that Adam and Eve sinned, He had every right to cast them into hell. He has every right, even right now, we are so wrapped up in, in, in the fact that God loves us. I think it's because we feel like we're lovable. Right? We're so wrapped up in the idea that, that He loves us because we're worthy to be loved that, that we forget that God could cast us into hell right now and be perfectly just in doing so. And He could do so for the rest of eternity. Right now, God could, and He, he would be perfectly just in doing this. Now, He wouldn't because He's promised. But let's just imagine that He hadn't promised this. He could right now decide that you, your family, your friends, everyone in this room, every generation from Adam till now and for a million generations in the future, he could cast all of us into hell and be perfectly just, perfectly loving in doing so. That can't be something that's a distant truth or an abstract truth from us, for us. It has to be something that we realize daily. Because if we don't understand that part, the justice of God, God's hatred for sin, the fact that He is righteous and holy, then we really don't understand mercy, do we? If we think that we're lovable, then mercy has very little value. Then grace has very little value because we feel like we're pretty lovable. But the reality is that, that we're rebels against God. And that God has every right to demand this perfection. He has every right to demand that Adam and Eve not touch anything. And you might ask, I don't know if you've ever done this. You ever ask why the tree was there in the first place? Why in the world was the tree there? Why in the world was there a serpent there? Who was Satan? And if God knew that what was going to happen, why would he still do it? Does God, even though you might not be able to answer that question, I think there is an answer, but if you don't think you can answer that question, that's okay. You still have to understand that God has every right to do it. Every right. And we can't say, well, hold on. What's up with the tree? Because God, in His infinite holiness and righteousness, can do whatever He desires. And every action that God does is perfect and righteous. So He has every right to do that. He has every right to cast Adam and Eve into hell. In fact, it was His divine mercy, of course, and goodness and love and grace that allowed Adam and Eve to not immediately go into an eternity of separation. So God has every right and every demand over us. Because all, all without Christ are perfectly guilty. It's kind of an oxymoron, perfectly guilty. But in every way, 
we're guilty before the Lord. And so as we as we look through Genesis, and this is really a really a helicopter view of this, right? We're we're really high above this truth. But if we really understand that all these character attributes of God, as much as our, our finite minds can understand them and grasp them, and then we also understand that God decided in his infinite glory to put man in the garden, and he has, of course, all these obligations upon man. Not that now God expects those things. But that man is required to obey, required to perfectly follow what God has set forth. God has perfectly given this structure and this order. Then, then we understand that there is this incredible, there's this incredible event that happens in Genesis when Adam and Eve sin. Now, we spend most of our lives knowing about the garden. We know about the garden. We know about Adam and Eve's life and their sin. And we, we treat it, I think, often as it's just an event, like on the timeline, the chart of human history. Well, they made a mistake here, and now we have all these different things. But they're the reason. So when you wake up in the morning and you feel bad because you have a cold, it's Adam's fault, right? If you stub your toe, it's Adam's fault. If you have a you know, surgery, it's Adam's fault. If you have an earache, it's Adam's fault. If you get a car wreck, if somebody you know dies, if you, when it comes, you will die. That's Adam's fault. But who's Adam? It's you, right? It's me. We're that guy. We're that guy. We're going to take the fruit just like Adam. We're going to take it just like Eve. You're going to sin the exact same way they did. You're going to do it. And so you might, I think even rightly so, criticize that like what in the world was he thinking he was thinking what you would be thinking and so he sinned he sinned against God and so now we understand that there is this monumental chasm that opens up and if we are to have a right view of ourselves now if we're really going to have a right view of ourselves now then we have to understand that we are in Adam so apart from Christ Listen, apart from Christ, when God, if we're apart from Christ, when God looks at you, he looks at you the same way he looked at Adam and Eve in the garden. With every right to pour forth infinite wrath upon you. Every right and complete justice to do so. So this should give us perspective, right? This is what we're trying to understand. We're trying to have our eyes opened up a little bit and our ears unclogged a little bit to see that this God of the Bible that we've already proclaimed him to be, now we need to see ourselves in light of this God of the Bible. That we are bound to obedience. And we have to understand this weight if we are to understand the gospel. We have to understand the high call of obedience. Why do you think we so diligently work with our children day in and day out? Probably not as much as we should, right? Because they're constantly making uh, errors and sinning, and, and we're, we're even forgetting or not even seeing half the times they do it, right? And we're try constantly trying to correct them. And in one of the reasons, hopefully if you're a believer, right, you're correcting because they need to understand that there's a tremendous weight from God himself to obey, and so we correct our children. We hopefully correct ourselves in those things because there is a tremendous high call of obedience for us. And we have to understand that. We have to understand properly that sin and guilt and the weight of judgment comes to those who disobey. Because we can understand all of these things about the gospel in, in, in word. Right? We can write them down. We can know the right things to say. But if we don't understand it, if we don't bear that weight, then we really don't get it. Then Christ is not really that big of a deal. His sacrifice on the cross wasn't that important. But it was. We have to understand the weight if we are to truly understand the mercy and the grace and the redemption of Christ. Where is grace? Where is mercy? Where is redemption when Adam and Eve sin? Because if you go back to Genesis 3, Adam and Eve sin and God pronounces this weighty curse upon them. Now God could have just killed them and sent them to hell. But he didn't. He pronounced this great curse upon them. You know, there would be enmity between, between man and, 
and the world. There'll be enmity between woman and the seed of man, or uh, uh, Satan and the seed of man through woman. All these different things that God pronounces as curses. And we have been cursed, of course, with this great fall of Adam. But there is only one place that redemption can come. There is only one place that mercy can come. There is only one place that goodness of God pouring over us can come. And that is in the murdered life of Christ on the cross. It only comes in the redemption found in the blood of Jesus. And so if we're to understand God correctly, and we're to understand ourselves correctly, we are in desperate need of a Savior. One who is outside of us that can come and rescue us. Not one like us, right? It's not help that we are saved by somebody else because we're not pure. Think about it. They looked at you and said, listen, you can be received into heaven if just someone sacrifices their life for yours. But it has to be someone pure. But you know no one like that. Only Christ can redeem men. Only Christ can save sinners. So, what does this mean? This means that to understand God correctly, to understand ourselves correctly. We must understand the weight and the responsibility that we have to obey. And that if you are in Christ, your sins have been paid for by the blood of Jesus. And so as much as we will continue to err, as much as we will continue to rebel and shake our fist at God, if we are in Christ, that has been bought and paid for. That has been bought and paid for. And so we're starting hopefully to see a better picture of who we are in Christ. That it's only by His great mercy, it's only by His great love, it's only by His great kindnesses that we can get back to that place that we were walking in the garden with God, right? That's really the whole whole pattern or the whole pathway, rather, of man is trying to get back to the garden. Adam and Eve were kicked out because of their sin. They're just trying to get back. And why are they trying to get back? Why are we trying to get back into the garden? It's not for the great vegetables, right? It's not for the fact that we don't have to work so hard. We don't have to break our back or break our body in childbirth. That's not what it is. It's to be walking in the presence of God. That's what we're trying to get back to. And God is in in His infinite mercies, in His continual grace has decided that He would save sinners and that He would reconcile men to Himself. So we have to see that. Not just see it, brothers. You have to believe it. You have to rest in that truth and realize that apart from Christ, there is no redemption. Apart from either perfect obedience or the redeeming blood of Christ, there is nothing else. Right? And so as we teach our children, as we plead with our neighbors to come to Christ, we know that they don't have perfect obedience. They display it every day. We display it every day. And the wrath of God looms over their lives. And so we say to them, please be reconciled to God. Go back to Christ. Run to Him. Flee to Him. Cling to Him. Because He is our only hope. We have this great call. Do not forget it. Even as we... As we fellowship together, as we work together in this, again, obedience is not just an Old Testament concept that was just broken in the garden. Now it really has no weight because now we're in Christ. No, even now, brothers and sisters, there should be a desire. I mentioned earlier this great desire, right, out of Romans 8, where Paul is saying we, we long for, we long to be with our Lord and Savior. What came right before this in chapter 7 of Romans? This battle that Paul's wrestling through, right? I'm constantly dealing with the flesh and it constantly wants to go in the wrong direction and I need Christ. Then he's battling with that over and over again. And then Romans 8, he says, I, I long, we long because of the brokenness of the world, because of the brokenness of in, our own, in our own bodies, in our own lives, we long to be glorified in Christ. That's what it comes from because we don't want to fight this battle anymore. And that should be the heart of the Christian that we try to be obedient. In the Old Testament, it was the Israelites running around saying, what can we do to make sure God doesn't kill us? Because we're obligated to obey. And that's all they wanted to do, just avoid the wrath of God. In Christ, though, our desire is is to avoid the wrath of God. 
But there is a, a great desire that comes in us as believers when the Holy Spirit stirs in us. But it's not just to avoid the wrath of God. Now we have that in Christ. It's now a desire, a genuine desire and a pleasure to obey the Lord. And so for the Christian, it shouldn't be, listen, we really try hard. We really try hard um, because I really love lying or I love pornography or I love gossiping or I love bad moods that, that, you know, I just want to be a jerk to everybody. But, you know, I really shouldn't, I guess, because of the Lord. And that's kind of sometimes I think as children, when you're raised up, that's what I thought. You know, I felt like, well, I don't want to do those things because I really shouldn't. There's no really other reason, but I just I shouldn't do it. There's some rules above me and I shouldn't do it. So, you know. I don't want the, the, the wrath to come down, whether it's wrath of my parents or the wrath of the law or the wrath of God, it's God himself. But in Christ, though, when we have redemption in Jesus, it flips that into a desire. And so you think about obedience. When you think about obedience, that should be a desire. Lord, help me obey because I want to. I want it. I hate when I disobey. I hate when my flesh fails. I hate when I, me, have thoughts of wickedness and live that out, whether it be in attitudes or in actions that I have in whatever way in life. Our desire should be to hate those things and cling to Christ. So remember, that, that's not just an Old Testament concept or a New Testament concept. This, this is what we're called to be in our Lord, to be obedient to Him, to follow Him. And we have a great Savior in Christ Jesus who has done what? Well, Christ perfectly obeyed. He didn't just want obedience. He loved <coughs> obedience and he wants to be obedient. He did when he was on the earth, but he did that perfectly. He never faltered. Not one, not one thought did he have that was awry. Not one thought did he have that, that, that went off in a different direction. Every single thing was for the glory of God. And now, if you're in Christ, you have the redemption of Jesus poured over us and the desires of Jesus to live for Him. If you are not in Christ, repent, come under the grace of the King of the world and rest in Him. But to have a better understanding of who God is, we must have a better understanding of who God is. Then we'll see that we are called to obedience. And that is going to be something that we, that we understand that we need even as believers. But we still have the, the blessings and the love of Christ and the kindness of Him. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you are a God who has given grace and redemption. That you are a God who, who loves. You are a God who loves and gives kindnesses though we don't deserve them. You could have sent Adam and Eve to hell immediately. But yet you were loving and you were kind. And you put, you placed your wrath upon Christ and not upon us. We could not bear it, Lord. It is too great for us to bear. So Christ bore it for us. Well, Lord, help us realize even day by day that tremendous weight that we have to obey right now that all of our thoughts, that all of our actions will, will be under submission to Christ. So that is a tremendous burden for us, Lord. But then we rest knowing that Christ takes that burden from us. He gives us His desires, but He takes that burden from us. He takes those sins and puts them on His back. Lord, let us have a right view of You in this regard. Help us have a right understanding of who You are and walking in Your ways, O oh Father. Thank You again for Your kindnesses. Thank You for the blood of Christ. Help our eyes be opened, our ears be opened to Your truths. Help us walk in a way that gives joy. And Lord, Give every single person in this room, every single believer, every single unbeliever even, save them and show them that we must and that we should by your Spirit working in us, that we must eagerly, eagerly hope for the coming of Christ and being glorified in Christ Jesus. That our lives in every single way would glorify your great name. Work these things in us now, God. Bless this fellowship that we're about to have. Help us to honor you in it as well. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. I want to read to you this uh, benediction, I guess.
out of 2 Corinthians chapter 13, the end, the last several chapters. It says, finally, brethren, rejoice, be made complete, be comforted, be like-minded, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.